All right. Well, thank you for coming. If you have your Bibles, would you open it to 1 Samuel? We're going to be preaching through the uh, entirety of 1 Samuel today. It's my joy to do that. So um, let's get started. Uh, Before we get into our study of 1 Samuel, it's important to look at why we have this book. Ask ourselves, why is this book here? And uh, one very compelling reason relates to God and his faithfulness to Israel. Uh, While Israel had been unrelenting in their sin, they sinned at every turn with with their God. Um, And they were largely unresponsive to God's kindness to them. God was faithful to his commitment. He was faithful to his covenant to them and to himself and his own name and his own character. So one of the reasons why we have 1 Samuel is because God is showing his faithfulness to his covenant promise to bring the Messiah to Israel, even after Israel rejected him as their king by asking for a man to be their king. So a lot of what we're going to be talking about tonight is God's faithfulness to his covenant commitment to Israel, despite Israel. There's good reason to believe that 1 Samuel was written sometime after the division of Israel into the northern and the southern kingdoms. Even though 2 Samuel ends with a description of the later years of David's rule, there are many references in both books to both the northern and the southern kingdom. And that would indicate a later date of writing, so perhaps it was written after um, the, the events that are being described. And scripture contains no clear statement of who the author of 1 Samuel is. Um, We know that his death is described towards the end of the the book in chapter 25. Um, So it could be that another uh, prophet or another seer wrote that, perhaps Nathan or or Gad or somebody like that. What we're going to do is we're going to look at a timeline. And a timeline is very helpful to help us understand where this book sits in history. Um, We just got done with the the prophets, and so we're going to start there. Um, Exodus from Egypt occurred about 1400 BC, about 1400, give or take. Uh, 1440 or so, and the conquest of the Promised Land began somewhere around 1400. And then uh, the the period of the Judges lasted for approximately 350 years, and it was about 1050, 1052 or thereabouts that Saul became king. And Saul was king for 42 years, and when he died, David became king at about 1010 BC or so. And David ruled for another uh, 40 years and until about 970 when he died. And then Solomon was king for 40 years until 930 BC. And that is when the kingdom was divided. So that's the time frame we're looking at here um, at the beginning of this, this time frame. So, but what we're going to do is we're going to look at uh, three things about Israel. We're going to look at Israel's neighbors. We're going to look at Israel's priests. And then we're going to look at Israel's people. And all of those are introductory so we understand the context in which this book sits. And uh, so Egypt, when we look at and consider Israel's neighbors, Egypt was no longer the, the power that they once were uh, a few hundred years earlier. They're mentioned only marginally in 1 Samuel. Uh, but the Philistines were gaining strength to the south and to the west. And uh, the nation of Ammon was a formidable, although a more regional power. And Assyria and Babylon had not yet gained prominence, and they were farther to the east. Uh, so of these nations, the Philistines were definitely the, the most significant nation that posed a threat to them. God had promised Israel in Deuteronomy 28 that if they would obey him and they would keep his commands, he would protect their land and he would would protect their borders and they would live in peace. But they were unfaithful to that. And because Israel had been unfaithful, God raised up other nations as tools of judgment for them. And in this time frame and in this book, the Philistines were that primary tool of God's choosing to chasten Israel. So that's a little bit about the neighbors of Israel. And uh, the main one to keep in mind is the Philistines as we consider this book. The other issue we want to look into are the priests themselves. And one of the biggest internal problems with Israel was their priests. They had an enormous problem with their priests. Scripture doesn't say much about Eli before 1 Samuel, but we do learn a lot about him from the early chapters in this book. And the area of greatest significance was his oversight over his sons. And that was weak and that was lacking. If you turn in your Bibles to chapter 4, and we're going to look at verse 12, we get a picture of the kind of of parent that Eli was and the kind of sons that were in his household. Chapter 4, verse 12. Now the sons of Eli were worthless men. They did not know the Lord. Now the story there is when a man was offering a sacrifice of boiled meat, the two sons would come and they would take for themselves a portion of the meat while it was still being boiled. And they would take that by force. 
And before the sacrifice was offered, the sons would take the sacrifice for themselves first, and they would do so without completely boiling the meat as was prescribed by God's law in Leviticus. And they were blatantly abusing their role for their own benefit and their own profit. Uh, They were also very immoral men. There were women whose service was to hold the bronze laver. This is very important because the priests used the bronze laver to wash their hands uh, before they would go in and offer sacrifices on behalf of the people. And this was a significant role. And Eli's sons were so immoral that it was common knowledge that they were conducting sexual relationships with many of these women. And they were doing it in broad daylight. It was common knowledge. And all of this was happening under Eli's watch. And so Eli gives them a weak rebuke for this, but his sons wouldn't listen to his father. And all of this fit within God's providence as he already had plans to end their lives. But all of this really points back to Eli and how unfaithful he was with his own household. And this pattern of poor family stewardship did continue with Samuel. And we're going to get into Samuel in great detail here. He too was unfaithful in the raising of his sons, and we'll hear more about that later. But it's important to remember that even the priests themselves were suspect during this time. And then we're going to take a look at Israel's people. We can understand that well. We just got through with Judges, and the way the Judges ends is you read in the very last chapter, the very last verse, Judges 21, 25, in those days there was no king in Israel. Everyone did what was right in his own eyes. So you had everybody determining for themselves what was right, and they were living that out. Israel was given everything they needed to live a fruitful life before the Lord. But they had been in the promised land for approximately 350 years, and that faithful generation which took the land and conquered it was long gone. And uh, they were living the way they chose to live. And we find a story in chapter 4 where Israel demonstrated just how indifferent they were to God's ways and God's design for them. At this time, the Lord's hand was very, very heavy upon them with the Philistines. And Israel was engaged in battle with the Philistines, and things weren't going very well for them, and the hand of the Lord was very heavy upon Israel. And the Ark of the Covenant was uh, in Shiloh at this time, and Israel was suffering great losses in the battle with the Philistines. And so the Israelites had a really good idea, what seemed to them like a good idea. And the elders proposed that the Ark be taken from its place at Shiloh and be brought to the Israelite camp. So what the elders proposed was that they would use the presence of the Lord that God had designed for them to meet with him and designed for them to worship him. And they would use that as some sort of aid and some sort of advantage militarily. But in his God sovereignty, God uh, granted the Philistines success in this battle and 30,000 foot soldiers from Israel were slain that day. And the Philistines took the ark back to their own cities. And in the process of doing so, Eli's two sons were killed. So God brought an end to the two sons of the priest that way. But what it points to really is is the Israelites and and their low esteem for for God's presence, low esteem for what God intended with his ark and what they wanted to use it for. Things had gotten so bad in Israel that that God took the life of the priest and his sons. And so the the situation here is a, a summary situation for Israel. You have the Philistines being the predominant military threat, and God used them very often in chastening of Israel. And the function of the priesthood was weak, and it was corrupt, and it was ineffective. And then thirdly, the people themselves were full of idolatry. Um, So things really were that bad. And so 1 Samuel is a narrative, so we're going to move left to right through 1 Samuel. And we're going to see in that the common thread being that God is faithful to his covenant to Israel, even when Israel is unfaithful to him. And there are several pieces to God's faithfulness, and one of them is the Davidic covenant. And we're going to look at that in more detail in two weeks when we get to 2 Samuel. But for today, just remember that God's covenant is the thing that he is faithful to, and he's going to provide much more detail on that in 2 Samuel in his covenant with David. So there are three characters that are in mind and that are very prominent when you look at the book of 1 Samuel. And those three characters are Samuel himself and Saul and David. And what we want to do is we want to look at how God used each of these three men as instruments to maintain his faithfulness to his own covenant with Israel. So we're going to look at how God used Samuel. We're going to look at how God used Saul and how God used David. Uh, Samuel was an obedient prophet, so we're going to look at how God used obedience. Uh, Saul was a sinful king, so we're going to look at how God is able to still use a sinful king in his process. And we're going to take a look at David and see how God was able to use a faithful future king. So let's get started with how God demonstrates his faithfulness to his covenant with Israel through an obedient prophet. 
And so Samuel's life lasts through chapter 25. So the, the record of Samuel and all his doings and comings and goings is going to be contained in the first 25 chapters of the book. And so what set Samuel apart from all of those who came before him was he was willing to do what was unpopular. He was willing to anoint David and he was willing to stand up to the current king. So we're going to look at a few areas in which Samuel's obedience to the Lord was the means by which God maintained his covenant faithfulness to Israel. And the first of these is that Samuel was not afraid to admonish the people. And we're going to see that in chapter 7. So if you have your Bibles, turn to chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 3 and 4 together. And there are many occasions on which he admonished Israel, but we're going to look at this one in particular and idols were popular with Israel. They were very, very popular. Israel had idols when they were in Egypt, and they brought their idols out of Egypt with them. They moved into the promised land. They left most of them behind, but as soon as they got there, they got new ones. So idols were a problem with them. They kept their idols. And God told Moses in Deuteronomy chapter one, uh, 31 that Israel would indeed arise, and they would play the harlot with the foreign nations, and they would engage with their idols. And they did. But because Samuel was obedient to God, he wasn't afraid to say the unpopular thing and admonish Israel to remove their idols from their midst. And he does that in chapter 7. And the context here is that the Lord had aroused the Philistines again. And they were his means of chastening Israel. And Israel had recently been defeated decisively by the Philistines. And the reason why they were defeated so decisively was because they were so sinful and so engaged in their own idolatry and their foreign worship of those idols. And Israel loved their idols, but Samuel knew that the ongoing worship of these idols would keep Israel from not only winning their battles, but more importantly, it would keep them from fulfilling God's design for them. And God's design for them is that they would be a light to the nations around them, that all the other nations, when they came to Israel, they would see a nation that functioned differently than, than all the other nations of the world. They would see that this nation doesn't have a king, and they would see that this nation functioned and succeeded, and, and they were living peacefully without a king. And that was God's design for them. But Samuel knew that they were going to fail at this if they had idols and they worshipped and bowed down to someone other than the God of Israel. So in verse 3, Samuel speaks to all the house of Israel and he says, If you return to Yahweh with all your heart, and if you remove the foreign gods from among you, and if you direct your hearts to Yahweh and you serve him, he will deliver you from the hand of the Philistines. So he's very clear with them. He says, remove the foreign gods and direct your hearts to the Lord. And in doing so, he will deliver you. So then in verse 4, the sons of Israel removed the Baals and the Asheroth, and they served the Lord alone. They served the Lord because Samuel encouraged them and exhorted them and admonished them to do that. So the Lord was merciful to Israel in that case. He responded to their obedience by routing the Philistines before Israel. So God did the work, and he used Samuel as the means by which they became aware of how wicked their hearts were, and they turned from their idol worship. So that's the first way that Samuel was useful, and he was really helpful, and the Lord was faithful in maintaining his commitment through Samuel that way. And the second is what we're going to see is something that seems kind of minor, but it's, it's really significant, and that is that Samuel judged the people. And we're going to see that still in chapter 7. We're going to look at verses 15 and 16. And Samuel was a very active judge and prophet. And what we really see here is we have a man who is, he has entered into the lives of Israel. And for a good part of the year, Samuel would leave his home and he would travel about Israel and he would judge their cases for them. He would travel to the three cities of Bethel, Gilgal, and Mizpah, and he would hear the grievances the people would bring before him. And Samuel would apply God's law to Israel to decide each case. We see this in verses 15 and 16. Now Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. So he did this consistently throughout his life. He used to go annually on the circuit to Bethel, Gilgal, Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all these places. And this doesn't really sound like very much, but it's something really significant when we step back and look at what really is happening here and what God is doing. And the people are coming to Samuel with their cases that need to be judged. And what Samuel is doing is he's not judging them with his own wisdom, but he is bringing to bear on their particular cases God's wisdom and the truth of God's law. And so in doing that, right in front of the people, he is putting God's law in front of the people themselves. 
So he's making them mindful and aware of God's wisdom and the rightness and the goodness and the strength and the power of God's word. So that's the second thing that, that God used Samuel towards. This was something that, that maintained God's commitment to his people by helping the people remember who God was and what his ways were for them. Third thing that, that Samuel did that was very, very helpful was he showed Israel a path of repentance. He didn't just point out their sin, but he actually demonstrated to them what it was they were supposed to do. And to see that, we're going we're gonna to look at something that occurs in chapter 12. It takes most of the chapter. Uh, but before we get there, we have to take a look back at what happened in chapter 8. And this is probably one of the most significant things in Israel's history. Now, over the course of time, Israel came to want a king. They absolutely wanted a king. So they came to Samuel and they asked for one. And this matter grieved Samuel. And Samuel was grieved for a number of reasons, one of which was they asked for a king because they looked at his own sons and so saw how unfaithful they were. But Samuel himself desperately desired for Israel to be the nation that God had intended it to be. He wanted Israel to stand apart from all the other nations, where Israel would look different, and on the basis of being a different nation, they would have the opportunity to explain and demonstrate who God really is. And he knew that God was a better king over Israel than any man would ever be. He knew that. The people of Israel didn't know that, um, but he did. But, and so he explained that to them. He explained the goodness and the rightness of, of God as your king. He explained to them how uh, a human king would be heavy upon them and would put burdens upon them. But if we look at verse 19, Israel is undeterred. And they showed that the wisdom of Samuel's warning to them had absolutely no meaning to them. Israel said, no, but there shall be a king over us that we may also be like all the other nations that our king may judge us and go out before us and fight our battles. Israel didn't want to be different from all the other nations. Israel wanted to be the same as the other nations. And they were willing to forego their privileged role, the role that God gave them to be able to explain him and demonstrate him to the world around them. They were willing to give up that, give that all up so they could be like all the other nations. So in verse 22, God spoke to Samuel and he said, listen to their voice and appoint them a king. So Samuel did. So that's the background. Samuel has appointed a king and Saul was that king. But the significance of that is that Israel wanted a king because they wanted to be like everybody else. So in, in chapter 12, we're gonna move forward to chapter 12 here. And the situation is again, that Israel is, is being chastened by the Lord. And we go to chapter 12, verse 17. And Samuel says to the people, is it not the wheat harvest today? I will call to Yahweh that he may send thunder and rain. Then you will know and you will see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of the Lord by asking for yourselves a king. So Samuel called to Yahweh and Yahweh sent thunder and rain that day. And all the people greatly feared the Lord and Samuel. And so in this, the people were able to see the depth of their sin. And the reason why they were able to see it was because Samuel was willing to tell them. He didn't just tell them, listen, you really blew it by asking for a king. He actually showed them a path of repentance. And we see that in the following verses. You drop down to verse 20. From verse 20 to 22, you see how Samuel outlines for them how it is that they can repent from their sin and return to obedience to the Lord. So Samuel said to the people, do not fear. You have committed all this evil. So he acknowledges their sin. Yet do not turn aside from following Yahweh, but serve Yahweh with all your heart. It's the same message. Don't turn aside, but serve him. You must not turn aside, for then you would go after futile things, which cannot profit or deliver, because they are futile. So he's speaking truth to them. For Yahweh will not abandon his people on account of his great name, because Yahweh has been pleased to make you a people for himself. So he's putting in front of Israel a path of repentance because Israel can't see, they have no longer able to see what they should see. They should see that what is important here is the greatness of God's name and that all the nations around them know the greatness of God's name. So it's important that not only do they acknowledge their sin, but they repent from their sin and return to the Lord and serve him so that they can represent him rightly. So Samuel was used by the Lord to restore Israel's awareness, at least temporarily, of what their role was and what it was that they should do to maintain and represent God's great name and uphold that. 
what we see as well is in a fourth area is that Samuel was not afraid to rebuke the king. So they have a king, this is a powerful king, and Samuel was not afraid to rebuke him. He was willing to say the difficult things to Saul um, as Saul attempted to expand his role from king to include priestly duties. And this occurs in chapter 13. So we're gonna go take a look at chapter 13 and, and see how Samuel was willing to say the difficult things to the king. And the context here is that Saul's son, Jonathan, had just smote the Philippines, Philistines. And Israel had become odious to the Philistines, but yet uh, they, they had uh, conquered the Philistines and had temporary victory over them. Samuel told Saul to wait seven days, after which point Samuel said he would arrive and they would offer a sacrifice together. And this was very important because there's a clear distinction and a delineation in Israel between the kingly role and the priestly role. They're always intended to be separate. We have a tribe for the king, we have a tribe for the priest. At this point, it was clear that they had to be separate roles. So Saul understood his role as king, but he wanted to take on for himself the role of priest. So Saul waited the prescribed number of days. He waited the minimum seven days that Samuel asked him to wait. But he came impatient in waiting for Samuel to arrive. And he was eager to gain the Lord's favor in his battle against the Philistines. So he offered the sacrifice anyway. He went right ahead and offered it rather than waiting for Samuel. And what he did was he added to his own role of king the role of priest. He took Samuel's role from himself, and took it upon himself. And so, of course, Samuel arrives very shortly after Saul offers his sacrifice. And instead of fearing Saul and going along with whatever Saul did, Samuel was willing to be obedient to the Lord and admonish Saul for violating the Lord's design for the kind of man who was disqualified and qualified to offer the sacrifice. So Samuel was not afraid to identify Saul's foolishness. And we see that in verse 13. He says to Saul, you have acted foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of the Lord your God, which he commanded you. But much more than that, Samuel was unafraid to tell the king that his rule would come to an end. That was brave and that was courageous of him to go to the king and tell him his rule was coming to an end. And back then, if a king didn't like the message, he got rid of the messenger. But that, that didn't deter Samuel. He didn't stop him. He went ahead and he told him the difficult things that he needed to in verse 14. But now your kingdom shall not endure. Yahweh has sought out for himself a man after his own heart, and Yahweh has appointed him as ruler over his people because you have not kept what the Lord commanded you. So Samuel was a faithful in instrument in his hands. He was very faithful. He rebuked Israel for their idol worship. He managed their daily affairs by judging them and revealing God's law to them and explaining to them how God's law was so good and so useful and so wise. He showed them a path of repentance and faithfulness when they sinned, and he informed their king that God was moving on from him to another king. And all of that was part of God's design for his, his promise to Israel and, and part of his faithfulness to his promise. So Samuel was a faithful instrument in God's hand, and God was using Samuel as a means by which he would remain faithful to his covenant with Israel. But what we want to see next is that God is able not only to use a faithful prophet and an obedient prophet, but he's able to use a sinful king. And so we're going to take a look at the Saul and see how God is able to use a sinful king to maintain his covenant promise and be faithful to his covenant promise to Israel. And when we consider Saul, we need to remember that the beginning of Saul's reign started out really well. Uh, he saw some success. And he was, he was seeing success in his life. And, the, and the, the end of Saul's account ends very, very badly. Saul ends up taking his own life. And what we can't get away from here is that God dedicates 23 chapters of this book describing um, the exploits of a sinful king. So the story goes on for 23 chapters. And then God uses, in great detail, uh, all of these pages of Scripture to show us a sinful king. And through all of that, God remains faithful despite the king's sinfulness. And we ask ourselves, well, why would God spend so much time in scripture explaining the exploits of such a sinful king for so long? And part of the answer there is to give a firsthand tangible proof that, that he is committed to the terms of his covenant with Israel, and he will maintain that despite the king. Even if the king leads them towards apostasy, God is unchanging in his purpose, and he's able to accomplish everything that he said he would do.
despite the king. So we're going to look at two different events of Saul's life, and we're going to see how God was used in those things, and God was faithful in those things, despite what Saul was doing to lead Israel astray. And both of these are going to happen uh, later in Saul's rule. And the first is Saul's disobedience with Amalek. And there's some background we have to go through here in the book of Exodus first before we get to this story in chapter 15. And it's in Exodus 17, so if you want to turn there, you can. God brought water out of a rock at Meribah when Israel was in the desert, in the wilderness. And it was shortly after that that King Amalek had gone to war with Israel. And this was the war where when Moses' hands were raised, Israel prevailed and succeeded in the battle. And when his hands were lowered, um, they did not. And Amalek prevailed. So what happened in that battle is that um, Aaron and Hur raised and they supported Moses' hands for the duration of the battle and Israel prevailed and they had victory. But nonetheless, the Lord was very displeased with Amalek. And in verse 14, Yahweh says to Moses, write this in a book as a memorial and recite it to Joshua that I will utterly blot out the memory of Amalek from under the heavens. So God has a plan and he had decreed and he had stated that he would blot out Amalek. So we turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 15 and we find out that that is exactly what God intends to do here. And so if you look at verses one through three, Samuel says to the Lord, uh, says to Saul, Yahweh sent me to anoint you as king over his people, over Israel. Now, therefore, listen to the words of Yahweh. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I will punish Amalek for what he did to Israel. Verse three, now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that he has. Very clear, all that he has. Do not spare him but put to death both man and woman, child and infant, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. So the instruction that God gives to Saul through Samuel is very, very clear. Strike Amalek, utterly destroy all that he has, and don't spare him and don't spare anybody else. This was to accomplish God's word that he would utterly blot out the memory of Amalek. So God's intention is that there would be no record of these people when Saul was done with them. So you see that in verse 7, God gave them success. Saul defeated them from Havilah as you go to Shur, which is east of Egypt. So there's a broad area there, and Saul destroyed them in that, that space and in that place. But then you see Saul's sinfulness. We're going to see his disobedience. We're going to see his deceit. We're going to see how he blame shifts. We're going to see how he's partially obedient, which means he's not obedient. And then we're going to see some false worship from Saul. And we're going to see that through all of that, God is still working towards maintaining his covenant promise with Israel. So what we see in, in verse 9 is the disobedience. But Saul and the people spared Agag and the best of the sheep. So they, they saw all the things that they wanted, the good stuff, and they spared that. And we see that Saul did that and the people did that. Then you drop down to verse 13 and you see Saul's deceit. Samuel came to Saul and, and said to him, Saul says, blessed are you of Yahweh. I have carried out the command of Yahweh. But Samuel said, what then is this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the oxen which I hear? So Samuel says, no, you didn't. You're claiming obedience. You did not obey. Then we see in verse 15 how Saul shifts the blame. And he says, well, the people spared the best of the sheep and the oxen. When God told us just a little bit earlier in verse 9 that Saul and the people did that together. So Samuel goes on to, to talk with him and share and explain that. And then we see his partial obedience in verse 20. And we all know that partial obedience really is no obedience. Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord. And I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. Now, therefore, so he, he explains his obedience and it's partial obedience. But he, even in explaining his obedience, he's revealing his disobedience because the Lord was very clear, you are to destroy Amalek. And he says, I brought him back. I brought back Agag, the king of Amalek. And then we see Saul's feigned worship in verses 24 and 25. 
Saul recognizes his sin and he says, I've sinned. But then in verse 25, he says, please pardon my sin and return with me that I may worship the Lord. And he wanted Samuel to return with him so that Israel would see him as a worshiper when there really wasn't any repentance, there really wasn't any acknowledgement of what he had done. And so what we see here is that, that Saul is clearly trusting in his own wisdom. He spared Agag and he spared the best of the flock because he wanted those things for himself. Uh, but the point here, really, the focus is not on Saul. It's on what God sees in Saul. God sees that he could no longer rely on Saul to lead Israel such that they would be the example that he intended them to be in front of all the other nations. So Saul was compromising Israel in their task of representing God to all the other nations. But nonetheless, the Lord remained faithful to his covenant with Israel. And what this leads us to is God's departure from Saul. God sees Saul. He sees his disobedience with the, the king of Amalek. And he says, I can't use him anymore. So Israel is still involved in their conflict with the Philistines. And David, having been listed in Saul's service, was seeing success in the battlefield and the exploits. I skipped a page. Okay. There we go. And so what happened is um, God was willing to use something else. He was using a means and a method for departing from Saul, or he's no longer going to use Saul. And they're engaged with the Philistines, and this is where we get to the story of David and Goliath. But the focus isn't going to be so much on the battlefield itself. It's going to be um, what happened around that. Um, we look at chapter 18. We're going to go see this in chapter 18. We're going to see, and here the focus really is on Saul himself and Saul's response. This is where David has gone out into battle, and the women are singing, and they're relating and they're comparing Saul's exploits and his victories to David's. And it says, Saul has slain his thousands, and David has slain his ten thousands. That's in verses 6 and 7. And what we see here is that Saul looked at David with suspicion from that day on. So in the midst of God seeing that or Saul seeing that God is delivering Israel on this occasion from the Philistines, Saul is looking at David with suspicion. So God is working for Israel's deliverance. He's working to lead them. And Saul is looking upon the one that God used to lead them with suspicion. We see in verse 10 that now it came about on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily upon Saul and he raved in the midst of his house. So what Saul did was look upon David with suspicion, but what God did was he sovereignly caused an evil spirit to enter into Saul. And what this is not saying is that somewhere in the set of all of God's character attributes is this place where God works evil. We, we know that's not true because Psalm 119 says in verse 68 that you are good and you do good. What this is saying is that God, in his sovereign control over all things, he chose to exercise his control over one of those things. And specifically, that one thing was an evil spirit, and he dispatched that evil spirit to Saul. That evil spirit was separate from God, and God dispatched it to Saul. And it's a means by which God is going to maintain his faithfulness to his covenant. And this follows long, not long after Saul's disobedience with Amalek. So right after Saul's disobedience with Amalek, God, in an effort to maintain and in, in the course of maintaining his faithfulness to his covenant, he moves on from Saul. God is saying that Saul is a king that will not serve the purposes of his covenant with Israel. And so he's going to begin the process of replacing him with another king. And he's going to do it by compromising Saul's spirit with an evil spirit. So we see there that, that Saul was able to, or that God was able to maintain his covenant promise with Israel despite what Saul did with Amalek. And in fact, he used that as a turning point to move on. And we didn't cover this. We're going to cover this in, in a bit when we get to David. But what we see here in the second way in which uh, God maintained his covenant promise with, David, uh, with Israel was that he, he did that despite the fact that Saul was pursuing David. And so God was maintaining this promise despite Saul's pursuit of the one that the Lord had anointed. Saul did what any self-reliant king would do when he looked on David with suspicion from that day on, he tried to kill David. I'm going to list seven different examples here from the story of 1 Samuel of where Saul tried to take David's life. 
These are just seven that are listed here. There are more. But in chapter 18, verse 11, Saul attempted to pin David to the wall with his spear. In chapter 18, verse 25, he asked David for a dowry of a hundred Philistine foreskins to marry his Saul, his daughter, Michael. He knew that David would probably be overwhelmed. And so that was his attempt to end David's life. That was his second one. In chapter 19, verse 10, again, he attempted to pin David to the wall with his spear. In the very next verse, in verse 11, he sent messengers to David's house to watch him and put him to death. In chapter 23, verse 8, he besieged an entire city. And we'll talk about this a little later, where David was saying, in order to put David to death, he besieged a whole city. In chapter 24, he pursues David in the wilderness of En Gedi. And in chapter 26, he pursues David in the wilderness of Ziph. So here David is, he's the anointed. In this process, Saul comes to understand that David is going to be the next king. Then, but in spite of all of that, Saul pursues David to kill David. Those are seven attempts on David's life. Saul is at the point in his reign where his powers of reason are starting to fail him. And this is what he says to David in the sixth of those seven attempts. Hopefully that's not for me. He says to Saul, uh, Saul says to David in, in chapter 24, verse 20, Now behold, I know that you surely will be king. The scene here is the one where Saul had gone into the cave to relieve himself and David took a portion of his robe and then later made Saul aware of the fact that he did take that portion of his robe. And Saul says, I know that you would surely be king and that the kingdom of Israel will be established in your hand. So Saul acknowledges that after his sixth attempt to take David. But if you turn ahead just one more chapter and go to chapter 26, you see that Saul again is pursuing him. So while he knows that David is, is the next king, he's the one who's going to be king, he's still trying to take his life. So in all of these instances, he's seeking to kill the Lord's anointed. And he was seeking to alter God's plans for the next king, even while he knew that David would be the next king. And he was again just operating in direct opposition to God's will and God's purposes. He was the king of God's people and he was actively seeking to thwart God's purposes with his people. But the Lord wasn't deterred in all of this. Despite all of Saul's sinfulness and all of the things that he did, the Lord wasn't deterred by this. He sustained him, David, through every single attempt by Saul to take his life. And so the Lord had this plan. He anoints David back in chapter 16. And he sustains David all the way through for years and years. And the reason why he did all of this was because he was going to be faithful to his own covenant. His own covenant was going to involve David. It was going to involve the family line that would come from David. Saul ended up losing his life in battle. And he died in the most inglorious way. He took his own life. And so we've looked at God's faithfulness to his covenant with Israel through an obedient prophet. We've looked at it through a sinful king. And what we're going to see here is that God is faithful to his covenant. And he's going to be faithful through a future king who is faithful. Through a faithful future king. And that's David. And again, the timeline is here that Saul was king from about 1050 to about 1010 BC. And then David was king from about 1010 till 970. And we learn in 2 Samuel that David was, was 30 years old when he became king. But we also know that in Israel, you could not participate in military service until you were 20 years old. So when David had his encounter with Goliath, he was probably less than 20. He might have been in his mid to late teens. So we can conclude from that that David was probably running from Saul for somewhere on the order of 10 years, something like that. What we're going to see here are several different ways in which God actually demonstrates to, through his operations with David, that he was faithful to his covenant. And the first one is his selection of David. And this happens in chapter 16. So let's go back to chapter 16. And this happens right on the heels of what Saul did with Amalek, where Saul refused to completely destroy them. As soon as that situation is over, God moves on to the next king. And he makes plans for the next king. So in verse 35 of chapter 15, you see the Lord regretted that he made Saul king over Israel. Very next verse, 
chapter 1, 16, verse 1, Yahweh said to Samuel, how long will you grieve over Saul since I have rejected him? God has rejected him. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have selected a king for myself from among his sons. So God had already selected a king for himself. He had already done this. A king that would execute his purpose and a king that would be his. See that? I have selected a king for myself. David is going to be the Lord's. He's going to be the instrument in the Lord's hands. And this is the kind of man that that he was looking for. And we know the story. Jesse had eight sons, and seven of them were present, the oldest seven. David was out yonder on the back 40, caring for the sheep. And they come in one by one. The Lord says to Samuel, who is looking at each one of these sons, do not look at his appearance or at the height of his stature, because I have rejected him. For God sees not as a man sees, but for man looks at the outward appearance, but the Lord looks at the heart. Then we drop down to verse 12, where we see what we're we're familiar with. So Jesse sent and brought David in, and the Lord said, Arise and anoint him, for this is he. This doesn't just identify David as the one who will be the next king. It identifies David as the one who has the kind of heart with with which the Lord looks on with favor. Because we see in that passage that God is looking for a man after his own heart. He's not just looking for a warm body to be the king. So David is the one, and he's the one because he has a heart that is after the Lord's heart. So God is making plans right here in chapter 16 to replace a sinful king with a faithful future king. The Lord is anointing the kind of king that will be useful to him since Saul was no longer useful to him. And God was maintaining his faithfulness to his covenant with Israel, and the first way that he did that was to select David as the king, the future king. What we're going to see that he does next is he positions David. He positions David in a a really unique position that's helpful. And so let's turn back to chapter 17 and we'll see this, how he does this. And we know the story of David and Goliath. It takes place there in 17. And the battle takes place towards the end of the chapter. But let's see how it was that David got to be there in the first place. Let's go back to verse 17 of chapter 17. David is back with his father, Jesse. And David has been anointed at this time. And Jesse says to David, take now for your brothers this roasted grain and these 10 loaves and run to the camp to your brothers. And I want you to bring word back for me as to how they're doing. So Jesse's purpose here is to learn how things are going with his sons. But God has another purpose in this. God knows David's zeal for his holy reputation and his name. And so when you drop down to verse 28, David delivers the goods to his brother. And then he sees what's taking place out on the plain. You have Israel. Israel on one side, and you have the Philistines on the other side, and you have Goliath calling out insults to the God of Israel. And so David speaks to the men who are standing by him, saying, Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? And we know how the story unfolds. David comes before Saul. Saul gives him his armor. The armor doesn't work for David. Saul somehow agrees to let David do this with David's weapons and David's mechanisms. And you see verse 49, what we all know. David put his hand into his bag and took him from it a stone, and he slung it and struck the Philistine in his forehead, and the stone sank into his forehead. And this is really impressive because a shepherd boy takes down the biggest, strongest, probably the most highly trained, most capable killer in the world at that time, and he does it with a sling. And the Lord enabled David to throw the sling at a speed of the stone from the sling at probably about 120 miles per hour with pinpoint accuracy right in the forehead. And he did it with the first stone. And so it's really, really impressive. But what I want to put our attention on here is not so much the event itself, but what God did through the event. And to see that, we look at verse 2 of chapter 18. Saul took him that day and did not let him return to his father's house. So Saul thinks he's getting a rising star in his military, and he is on one level, but God has other plans. What he's doing is he is positioning David inside Saul's military, and this is a step that will eventually give David the kind of notoriety which will allow him to accumulate a following, a following of approximately 400 to 600 men that will be very useful on his path to becoming king years later. But David isn't yet king, so God has selected David, and God has positioned David What we're going to see that God does now is that God protects David. And we see that, and we're going to turn to chapter 19. And there are many, many examples of this 
and we could go through many, many more of this. I'm gonna use two of the more unfamiliar, two of the more less popular examples. And we're gonna see that, that God protects David. And again, David was on the run from Saul for many, many years. And the first we're gonna see is in chapter 19. We're gonna start at verse 20. Uh, David is staying with Samuel at this point. Samuel is still alive. And there is danger. And the danger is in verse 20, at the beginning of the chapter, Saul sent messengers to take David. And the intent there was to kill David. They were to take him and bring him back to Saul so that Saul could take David's life. And you see what God did. So the danger is the messengers are coming and you see God's protection at the end of verse 20. But when they, the messengers, saw the company of prophets that were prophesying with Samuel, which is where David is, standing and presiding over them, the spirit of God came upon the messengers of Saul and they also prophesied. And that happened three times. They go back, they come again to Ramah, they go back and they come back a third time. You drop down to verse 23, Saul's getting tired of this, so he decides to try it. Saul proceeded there to Ramah and the spirit of God came upon him also so that he went along prophesying continually so here's the very man who wanted to take his life and he's going to David to take his life and he finds himself prophesying. So God intervenes in the lives of the messengers who were intended to take him to Saul so Saul could kill him. And he intervened in Saul's life so Saul could not kill him. And God's purpose in that is protect David because David was gonna be a significant part of his covenant promise to Israel. And so David remains faithful in this. David doesn't run from the situation. David is faithful in the life that God gave him and that the Lord prepared for him. So that's the first way in which we see God protecting David. We're going to look at one other one, and that's in, still in, uh, it's in chapter 23. And David is in a, a city called Keilah. We mentioned this earlier at the beginning. And what Saul did was he summoned all of the people in verse 8 of chapter 23 to surround the city and build up siege works against it to starve out the city so that the people would give up David. So Saul summoned all the people for war to go down to Keilah to besiege David and his men. And what Saul is doing here is he is trying to coerce the people of that city into giving up David so that, so that they could save up their own lives. And we're going to see how God intervenes with his protection here. So David says to the Lord, will the men of Keilah surrender me and my men into the hand of Saul? And the Lord said, they will surrender you. The Lord knows exactly what they intend to do. Then David and his men, about 600, arose and departed, and they went wherever they could go. So here what God is doing is he is showing David what is going to take place in the place that he had gone for refuge. And David remains faithful. He doesn't run again. He stays. He stays to what God is in the situation that God has put in front of him. And he is faithful to that. And what God is doing is he's preserving David again and again and again. So those are the examples, and there are many, many more in which God preserves David's life. And the point of preserving David's life was so that he could continue to function in the role that God had intended for him to lead Israel in the way that God intended him to lead Israel so that he could be faithful to his covenant promise to Israel. So every one of these situations fits within that framework that God is protecting David God is placing David, he's identifying David, so that David could be the, the instrument that he intended him to be in maintaining his covenant promise. And all of this takes place in, a, in the first generation of Israel's kings. This is really significant because up to this point, Israel didn't have a king. And now they were stepping into a new territory for them and they were being like all the other nations around them. But God was still able to, despite Israel's disobedience, despite Israel's will to be like everybody else and not be a nation that is separate, God is still able to be faithful to his own covenant. And we'll see the fruit of that next time, in two weeks from now, when we look at 2 Samuel, we'll see the fruit of what that looked like as David became king. So let's pray. Lord, I thank you that you are faithful to your promises. I thank you that you are true to your promises. Oh Lord, it is a blessing to us that you established a throne for David and you established a kingly line and it was from that line that your son came. Lord, thank you for your faithfulness through uh, all of the events that took place in this book. Lord, the events of priests who are unfaithful to you, 
the events of a king who is sinful, the events of a, a future king who is on the run. Lord, that you were not deterred in any of that, but you were faithful to maintain your own promise to your own people. And Lord, we see and we know the benefit of that because it was from those people that, that you brought your son for us. And Lord, we recognize again that you gave your son to us and we rejoice in that. Thank you, Lord, that you are not constrained by us and our own abilities, but thank you, Lord, that you are constrained only by your plans and your purposes, which you will execute. Lord, we praise you and we worship you in Christ's name. Amen.